So uh, you can turn the cameras back on and, uh, and uh, any recording devices that you may have. Um, I'm Ernie Bauer again. Uh, I'm the chair of the uh, Southeast Asia uh, program here at CSIS. And it's a real pleasure for me to uh, be introducing our, our third and last panel today on, uh, and as we talk about uh, Asian architecture ahead of the, um, the three summits uh, in November, the APEC, EAS, and, uh, and G20 summits. And um, we've got a terrific panel uh, with us today. I really appreciate these gentlemen sharing their time uh, away from very busy schedules to, uh, to join us. On my right, uh, we have the um, newly, uh, newly ensconced uh, David Shear, who's our Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia and the Pacific. Um, you know that David was, uh, had come back from Hanoi to do this job. He was our U.S. Ambassador there. Um, David is a, an expert uh, on China and Southeast Asia. Uh, I think for many of us who are um, sort of in the trenches every day on these issues, I couldn't think of a better person uh, for uh, the Pentagon to put into this role. Um, next to him is uh, one of the top um, Southeast Asianists in, uh, in the United States, <laughs> and, uh, and he also is uh, uh, Singapore's ambassador to the United States, uh, uh, um, Ashok Mirpuri. He was uh, most recently uh, Singapore's ambassador to Indonesia. He was, in, in the past, has been Singapore's ambassador also to Australia and to Kuala Lumpur and has a, a long um, uh, career uh, in the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, working on uh, Asia-related affairs. And finally, a good friend um, and an, a real uh, hero uh, of Southeast Asia and Asian policy uh, in the Senate is Chris Brose. He, um, he works with Senator McCain uh, in Senator McCain's office. Pre previous, uh, before that, he was a senior staffer uh, in the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, and Chris uh, came, rose through the ranks um, doing some pretty interesting things, including writing speeches for and advising uh, people like Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. Uh, so he really knows what he's doing and has spent a lot of time in Asia, much more than uh, most Senate staffers, uh, unfortunately. So uh, without further ado, what we want to talk about in this panel is um, uh, architecture as it relates to security. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to kick it off uh, in the order uh, that we're seated in, and then we'll open up the panel to some question and answer. So, David, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Ernie. It's great to be back at CSIS, and it's a uh, it's great honor to be joined up here with uh, Ambassador Mirpuri and Chris Bros. Um, I've been in my job, my new job at DOD for almost exactly one month now, and I can tell you um, from my experience during that one month that Secretary of Defense Hagel certainly has a very strong personal interest in Asia and East Asia, um, given all of his history. Um, the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy my chain of command are deeply committed to the rebalance to East Asia, and we've seen that m most recently in Deputy Secretary Work's uh, travel to the region. You'll see a flurry of senior level uh, meetings and encounters uh, this fall, including coming up a uh, security subcommittee meeting uh, chaired on the American side by myself and East Asia uh, Assistant Secretary of State Danny Russell in Tokyo next week. Danny and I will also be going to Seoul before we go to Tokyo. Um, you'll see a uh, defense consultative talks uh, with the Chinese. You'll see a uh, military consultative meeting and security consultative meeting with our, our ROK allies. Um, also in November, of course, uh, President Obama will be visiting Beijing and defense issues will, of course, be part of his agenda in his bilateral discussions with President Xi. So, uh, again, the rebalance is uh, uh, among the highest priorities on my agenda as well as on my senior leadership's 
agenda, and you'll, you'll see me uh, focusing very clearly on rebalance-related issues in, in my earliest days in my tenure. I'd like to share with you some of the issues that, uh, some of the big issues I'll be fo focusing on, I think, as Assist Assistant Secretary of Defense over the next months and years. And the first one is modernizing our alliances and partnerships. Uh, there's a lot on the agenda in, in this regard, from the review of the defense guidelines with Japan to the uh, OPCON issue with uh, our ROK allies, to updating the defense framework with India, which we mentioned in the joint statement most in uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's recent visit to Washington, uh, to the EDCA with the Philippines and the FPA with Australia. All of these are foundational issues in the strengthening of our alliance uh, architecture in the Western Pacific. And all of these will guide uh, the way in which we shape our alliances over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, we're gonna wanna finish strong on all of these agreements. Uh, successful conclusion and impl implementation matters. Uh, and uh, this certainly will set the stage for uh, closer cooperation uh, between the United States and its important allies in East, in East Asia and the Pacific. Um, a second uh, very important uh, big issue we'll be working on is solidifying the military to military relationship with China. Uh, Secretary Hagel had a very good meeting with Foreign Minister Wang Yi the other day here in Washington. Uh, the Foreign Minister was here to, of course, to review U.S. bilateral relations and planning for the President's trip to Beijing. Um, as you ha probably have seen um, in the strategic and economic dialogue, both sides recommitted to uh, working on a set of confidence-building measures, and we will be uh, working on that set um, in advance of the President's trip to Beijing. Um, a third set of uh, big issues we'll be, we'll be working on is um, knitting together allied and partner cooperation. And uh, Evan Medeiros uh, spoke uh, during his remarks of our trilateral partnerships, particularly U.S.-Japan, Australia, U.S.-Japan, India. But we're also interested in encouraging greater cooperation among our allies and partners in East Asia. We're very gratified to see increased cooperation between Japan and Australia, between Japan and India. We're also gratified to see greater uh, diplomatic coordination between uh, partners and friends like Vietnam, the Philippines, and Malaysia. All of this greatly strengthens uh, security and stability in the Asia Pacific, um, and we believe can contribute to the uh, reduction of tensions, particularly in the South China Sea. Uh, another area I'll be focusing on, of course, is um, strengthening U.S. ASEAN defense ties. Um, we've seen the establishment over the past few years of the ADMM Plus. Um, uh, we've had great uh, progress in building regional defense cooperation. Um, Secretary Hagel certainly is, is uh, very interested in his um, uh, uh, encounters with his counterparts during Shangri-La dialogue at the ADMM Plus, and most recently, uh, also recently in April, in connection with the U.S. ASEAN Defense uh, Ministerial meeting in, in Honolulu, and we hope that that can be a future fixture in our uh, defense relations with ASEAN. Of course, as we um, work all of these issues with um, our partners, friends, and others in East Asia will also want to be working with them to manage, uh, to manage uh, disputes and issues that generate tension. Um, I don't need to mention um, how important uh, maintaining security and stability, particularly in the South China Sea, is to us. Um, uh, our position on this has been made crystal clear on many occasions. It, it's going to remain a, a very strong focus for me and for my leadership in DOD uh, in the coming months. Why don't I stop there and let my other 
my other uh, friends comment. Okay. Thank you, David. Ambassador. Thank you, Annie, and congratulations again to you and CSIS for putting together this conference to look at the, some of these bigger pictures in the Asian architecture, and in particular security architecture, because how critical it is for U.S. interests going forward. I wanted to look both at the big picture and at, uh, as a, at ASEAN's role, because as an ASEAN ambassador here, much of the architecture really focuses around, around ASEAN centrality. But the main reason why the architecture is important is that the region has enjoyed a peaceful and secure and stable environment for several decades, something that many of us, in fact, take for granted. And these conditions have enabled growth and prosperity, which is the key thing that we want to see out of the Asia Pacific. So the regional architecture, both the security and the economic architecture, is really designed to preserve this. But in this post-Cold War geopolitical environment, we're starting to see fairly dramatic shifts. And that's where conversations about the architecture become important. The environment is shifting, and Southeast Asia in particular is becoming more compl complicated as a region as we have to reposition ourselves in the context of Washington's and Beijing's search for a new equilibrium. The regional dynamics are complex. It's more than just Washington and Beijing. There are other major powers that continue to adjust the relationship with each other and with ASEAN. And tensions in the region have risen. And there are several potential flashpoints that have to be managed. And that makes the architecture a very important issue for us to look at. Now, ASEAN's role and this term of ASEAN centrality has, in many ways, played a very crucial part in maintaining regional peace and security. But I don't want to overplay this role and ASEAN strategic weight. Those of you who know ASEAN and know the rest of the region, you know that this is ASEAN's central role is probably due to the fact that we are a neutral platform rather than because we carry such a strategic heft. Because in that neutral platform, ASEAN has offered a space for all major powers to discuss issues of concern, to build trust and to promote cooperation. And what ASEAN has done has been to promote an open and inclusive approach and welcomes the engagement of all major powers. It's a critical part of ASEAN that we're not just an inward-looking organization of the 10, but we're an outward-looking organization that includes our dialogue partners and other major powers with us. And this is characteristic in all the ASEAN-led mechanisms that we have made, put in place that form a regional architecture that is open, inclusive, and outward-looking. In particular, we value the contribution of the U.S. to all of these ASEAN-led forum, such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, and the East Asia Summit. For more than 60 years, the U.S. presence has been a stabilizing influence that has underpinned Asia's and ASEAN's growth. There are, and we will hear this regularly, multiple and overlapping structures of this ASEAN regional architecture that reflect in many ways the complex diversity of the Asia-Pacific region. From our view, this overlapping structures actually makes the regional framework more flexible and resilient. Let me go through briefly each one of the structures that we have in the security area. The first and the longest running has been the ARF, which was created in 1994 as a forum for security discussions that will engage not just the major powers, but also middle and smaller regional powers to preserve their stake in the regional stability in the post-Cold War era. For example, the ARF today is the only multilateral security consultative framework in the region in which the DPRK participates. The, another structure that we have is the ADMM Plus, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, which came into force in 2006. Its establishment of the ADMM first was really the commitment of ASEAN countries to have their military establishments to work together to address transnational security issues. We then expanded this to have the ADMM Plus, which comprises ASEAN with the eight other EAS partners that has become not just a channel for dialogue, but also an action-oriented avenue for defense ministers from the region and beyond to come together to, to discuss practical solutions to manage peace and they've done exercises that pull together various militaries into, into these operations. 
The third structure is the EAS, which we're all looking forward to next month, which the President will attend. And with the expansion of the EAS was established in 2005, and with its expansion in 2011 to include the US and Russia, it has again brought the major powers together into a leaders-led forum. The key focus now for the EAS is really to focus on consolidating for the future. And while it remains a leaders-led forum for strategic discussions of the future, what ASEAN is very keen to have brought into the EAS as well is areas of functional cooperation. Because these really, this, this add to the agenda and help to build on the architecture in order to keep the mechanism alive and healthy. It adds a certain balance to the structure and ensure that the EES remains a credible forum for constructive cooperation. And various ideas in which the US can play a role in some of these functional cooperation areas include obviously disaster management, education, finance, energy, which you spoke about earlier this morning. Now, looking ahead at all these structures, a frequent complaint and almost criticism has been that all these ASEAN-centered regional architecture structures have emerged into a spaghetti bowl that people find difficult to unravel. From ASEAN's point of view, these mechanisms actually each play a unique role, and they complement and reinforce each other to serve the common interests of maintaining regional stability and growth. The perspective of trying to rationalize the security architecture into a single arrangement or to try to impose a hierarchy among them will be very difficult, if not impossible. Instead, our view is that these regional structures and architecture should be allowed to evolve, adapt, and find their natural dynamic equilibrium at their own pace as we improve ways to, to get better coordination and develop synergy among the mechanisms. And in this regard, we've now actually welcomed the dialogue partners to give their ideas for the future of this architecture and taking on proposals on how to improve the existing frameworks. But what is critical in all this is that we must ensure that we, the regional architecture, for all the reasons that they have been successful, is that ASEAN remains very much at the core, keeps that place as a neutral platform, and continues to, to reflect the diversity of the region and remain open and inclusive. Indonesia, in particular from ASEAN, has proposed an Indo-Pacific Treaty. And next week, in Jakarta, the EAS Workshop on Regional Security Framework will meet to discuss this further. And these are some of the ideas that we're looking ahead of how can we make this, the whole architecture much better. Let me say a few words about the US engagement. As I said earlier, the US has played an integral role in the regional architecture and remains a critical and unique component in the future. It is important for the U.S. to stay engaged, and this engagement must be broad-based and multi-pronged. The region appreciates the U.S. continued support for ASEAN centrality, and it's come across time and again in the various comments and speeches that have been made by U.S. leaders about how important the ASEAN centrality is in the evolving regional architecture. And importantly, ASEAN and the U.S. share many strategic perspectives, and we should work together to continue to build up the existing institutions, and keep the architecture open. We also welcome the U.S. support for key principles like peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, the right of freedom of navigation, and the right of overflight. So in conclusion, let me just summarize the three principles that ASEAN really looks at the regional architecture from our perspective. First, ASEAN should be at its core in order to maintain ASEAN unity and cooperation. Second, it should reflect the diversity of the region. And third, it should remain open and inclusive. So as there are multiple and overlapping structures that are sometimes redundant, from our point of view, they actually make the regional architecture more resilient and stable. And from our point of view, the architecture should follow the agenda rather than vice versa. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, I think you, you want to give the ambassador a round of applause for that. He's honest. I, I, I heard it coming. <laughs> I don't want to deny that to you because it was, it was organic and it was coming your way. Chris, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ernie, and thanks, CSIS, for having me here today. Um, obviously, look, I'm, I'm extremely flattered to be among the company that I'm in. Uh, clearly, you know, you can tell one of these things is not like the other. Um, my first name is not Ambassador. And by way of making the point further, I was telling you know, Dave earlier that I think you know, my sort of sign signature accomplishment on Asia this year uh, has been playing some small role in the confirmation of Dave Shear. 
Um, so, you know, it, you, you, you can sort of see clearly what you're getting here. Um, look, Congress is not a participant uh, in, in Asia's architecture, and, you know, maybe you can all be thankful for that. Um, what, what I'd like to try to do is just give you a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, how the Hill is looking at some of these security challenges. Uh, we can kind of back into the, into the Asia architecture question. Um, and, and what I'd like to try to do is sort of frame it in terms of two questions, both of which kind of appeared on the cover of The Economist this year. Uh, and I think these are the kind of, uh, these are the two questions that are really kind of overhanging. And the first, this was a couple weeks back, uh, very plainly, what does China want? Uh, this is something that, you know, I think as, as members of Congress are looking at the region, they're increasingly traveling through the region. Uh, I'd stress it's still uh, a small group. It's not by any means extensive to the entire uh, body. Uh, this is a question that I think members of Congress are confronting. Uh, they want the United States to have and believe the United States can have and should have uh, a very constructive relationship with China. They see all of the benefits and all of the common areas of cooperation between the countries. Um, and they recognize that you know it's there's a lot of upside there uh, for, for both countries together. And yet, they, they look at uh, a sort of a pattern of behavior that is concerning to them. And, you know, the pattern of behavior is something like this. You know, it's, it's a series of actions that are not sort of purely diplomatic, neither are they purely military. They sort of occur uh, in a gray area. Uh, there appears to be, you know, sort of a strategy of incremental uh, creation of facts on the ground or in the air or uh, at the sea. And, you know, there's a concern, I think, that this is uh, what, what, what we are seeing is sort of a long game, uh, uh, an attempt to incrementally, uh, move by move, change the status quo uh, unilaterally, uh, never in a way that sort of fundamentally trips a wire and, uh, you know, triggers a, a response on behalf of the United States or others, uh, but nonetheless continues to move the needle such that five to ten years from now we're all looking back uh, and, it's a it's a very different uh, it's a very different region that we're that we're looking at, and, and I think you know there's the, the the sort of the prevailing view in the Congress is look I mean China thinks about its foreign policy, uh, so when people say well you know China surely you know that you know you're causing other countries to gang up against you to criticize you et cetera you're driving them closer to the United States. Uh, you know, I think the, the kind of prevailing view on the Hill is, well, there's, there's intent there, um, even if we have to infer it from action. And, you know, that intent is perhaps unsettling, which is uh, this, this, to some extent, does reflect uh, conscious action. And it's about more than the particular territorial claims that we can discuss today further. Uh, it's about, you know, a conscious attempt to challenge the balance of power and change it. Uh, about even changing key elements or challenging key elements of the international order, particularly the peaceful resolution of disputes. Uh, and that most fundamentally, I think, as an American is concerned, it's, uh, it's a challenge to the American presence and sort of historical role in Asia and commitments to countries that we have, either uh, formal treaty commitments or otherwise. Um, so I think the, the question that I think many members of Congress and the sort of prevailing view in the Congress comes back to uh, is again, what does what does China want? Um, the second the second sort of security challenge that I'd I'd point out, maybe somewhat provocatively, um, also appeared on the cover of the Economist, and it was what would America fight for? Um, now, fight is not necessarily to be used literally, but I think the point is, what is America ultimately seeking to do? What are we truly committed to doing? Uh, what are our red lines, uh, et cetera? And I think, you know, as, as uh, members of Congress, congressional staff travel through Asia, uh, particularly ones who are, you know, maybe less uh, experienced there, they're struck by a prevailing uh, sense and pervasive sense of doubt and question about the United States. And this isn't so much a question of, you know, questioning America's capability. Uh, you know, there's a lot of capability economically, militarily, et cetera. Although I think increasingly people are questioning that too as we see the effects of sequestration and, and declining budgets, et cetera. Uh, I think it's more a sense, uh, and again, this is what, what, what people sense traveling through the region. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of America's resolve, commitment, uh, judgment, you know, what it's ultimately seeking to do here. And you know, there are different reasons for this. Uh, obviously, I think there's the sense of people looking at our opinion polls. Um, obviously, they can discern that Americans aren't too into foreign policy at the moment. That may be changing. Uh, but there's a question of sort of national 
uh, distraction to what extent Americans are focused on this. Um, there's also, you know, sort of the question of national dysfunction. Um, you know, the question of, look, America can't even fit, fix its own fiscal problems. Um, how much are they really going to help us when we need them? Uh, there's that doubt that, that, that lingers out there. And then, uh, look, I mean, I would say when it comes to Asia uh, and security policy, there's a lot of bipartisan cooperation. Um, and it really is an area that is, is somewhat uh, unique from other aspects of our foreign policy, where I think there's broad consensus on the rebalance. Uh, that being said, I think there's a real question about whether the rebalance is, is sort of coming into being. Uh, and that is a sense that we hear as we travel throughout the region as well. Uh, is this more rhetoric than reality? Um, and I think part of this, too, is, you know, it's a question about the U.S. response to Asia. And, I mean, I heard most of uh, Evan's speech, and most of it I would agree with. Uh, I think the question is not, is America doing something? Clearly, America is. The question is, is what America is doing adding up to a set of actions, you know, unilaterally, bilaterally, multilaterally, uh, that is fundamentally uh, impacting China's calculus as it presses out in the East China Sea, South China Sea, et cetera. Um, and look, there's the other piece of this which overhangs it, which is that this isn't just about Asia. Um, you know, our sense and things, something that I think many members of Congress have been struck about is how much uh, in their conversations on security issues, uh, you know, with Asian partners, the topic comes back to Ukraine. Uh, and what's happening there and how the U.S. is responding. Or last year, uh, the response to Syria, the sort of crossing of the purported red line and the lack of follow-through and many people in Asia asking, what, what are the implications of this for us? And maybe that's an unfair question, maybe it's out of bounds, but it's real. And that's something that I think, uh, you know, again, many members of Congress are very, are very sensitive to. Um, so I just say, uh, in conclusion, you know, the architectural issues that we're discussing here are very important, and there's a lot of potential for them to resolve these kinds of challenges, to clarify people's views and thinking. Um, but, you know, uh, age-old problem, you know, geopolitics really determines the capacity uh, and ability of architecture to function. Uh, and I think when it comes to the geopolitics right now, you know, the, the, the two questions that I tried to lay out today uh, are, are really concerning. Uh, there are questions that I think here in this town we're still sort of uh, seeking answers on and, and trying to come up with better answers on. Uh, and it's still going to overhang, you know, our diplomacy and, and what we're seeing as uh, the region comes together in November for these summits. Thank you very much uh, for those remarks, Chris, and, and, and thank you for the panel. Uh, for your excellent um, insights. I'd like to start with a question and then open the floor. Uh, um, and the question is, um, many have argued that um, the foundation of long-term security in Asia is economics. And uh, I don't, didn't hear any of you sort of talking about that. I wonder, would you agree, or do you think it's sort of a separate uh, channel uh, that that security thinking is linked to, but it's not related to. How do how do you think about it? I snuck in one word that said economics, but <laughs> and then Chris, of course, referred to the economists throughout. So you know that you know how the whole thing. But you know it is they go together because we had the morning discussion on the economic architecture. I didn't want to get into all that. The key thing that uh, obviously is there is TPP. It's top of the mind of every Asia-Pacific leader whether or not they're in TPP. Because even those who are out wonder what it means for them and how can they get into it. And those who are in obviously are in the throes of very difficult negotiations to get it done. And in particular, the, for the US, the constant conversation that comes up in all meetings is when are we going to get this thing done? It, really is that key, not just about the economic future of U.S. interests, but also the key of the strategic engagement of the U.S. in the region. It's becoming in many ways a test of how people see the U.S. engagement in the region. And I think that looking ahead, that's what we want to see get done. There are other elements, obviously, of the economic bits as well, the entire trade structures. We have RCEP uh, that does not include the U.S. The ASEAN economic community comes into force next year. All these things are happening. But for the U.S., I think getting the TPP done is a critical thing. I want to address your question from a slightly 
different angle by saying, by drawing on my experience as ambassador to Vietnam. Um, uh, some people have said that the rebalance is primarily a military strategy, and I want to try and counter that impression. Um, in Vietnam, the rebalance certainly, and throughout the region actually, it certainly uh, brings all of the uh, tools of statecraft together to pursue our interests in the region. In Vietnam, we were pursuing, uh, we were using the diplomatic tool by increasing our uh, co diplomatic coordination with the Vietnamese, particularly on regional, regional issues um, within the con multilateral context. Um, we, on the economic side, we, uh, of course, uh, are negotiating with uh, Viet Vietnam as a member of, uh, as a TPP partner, um, and both Americans and Vietnamese, I believe, recognize that TPP is not just, um, and will not just uh, benefit us economically, but it's also strategic in many ways. Um, finally, um, we uh, very strongly promoted defense cooperation with Vietnam, um, and we see the fruition of our efforts in that regard with the partial lifting of the ban on lethal weapon sales to Vietnam just yesterday. So our uh, implementation of the rebalance in Vietnam certainly was multi-pronged, and again, it relied on all the tools of, of statecraft to pursue our interests, and that's what we're doing throughout the region. And if there's uncertainty in the region, it shouldn't be uncertainty about the U.S. commitment to continued peace, security, and prosperity there. Thank you. Chris, you yeah, just a, just a very brief point. I mean, I agree completely with, uh, with, with what both uh, Dave and the Ambassador said. Uh, TPP is critical to get done. Without it, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a, real, a real problem the U.S. faces, and totally agree that the rebalance cannot be one-dimensional. Um, I think that the, the challenge is that if you look at the sort of economic trend in the region, it is toward greater integration. It's a very positive trend. Um, I think the concern is that the security trend may be heading, if not in the opposite direction, not exactly in the same direction. Uh, maybe not fragmentation, but you know certainly rising tension. And you know, this is something that you know Evan Feigenbaum, Bob Manning have pointed out. You know, can you continue to have you know economic integration when you have rising security tensions uh, and strategic challenges? Is that something that is sustainable or uh, uh, or not? Thank you. Okay, floor is open. Uh, let's start here. This gentleman in the front. Again, just please uh, tell us uh, your name and your affiliation, if you have one. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jason Zhang. I'm a reporter with the uh, South Korea's Yonam News Agency. Uh, I have a question for uh, Assistant Secretary Scheer. And uh, you mentioned the OPCON as one of the issues that, is, that are related to the uh, modernization of the alliances. Uh, as you know, uh, United States and Korea plan to announced an agreement on delaying the Afghan transfer when they hold the annual defense ministers meeting uh, later this month. Uh, 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 can you tell us about uh, how close the two countries are uh, to agreement uh, at this point? Thank you. We agree with you that that remains uh, the deadline for our discussions on Afghan. Of course, we're, discuss we're uh, discussing a conditions-based approach uh, to Afghan with our, our ROK counterparts. And this is going to be an issue that I certainly focus on um, during my uh, presence next, next week in Seoul. Okay. You're getting good at this defense stuff. <laughs> Emil. <clears throat> uh, right here, the uh, gentleman in the front. Uh... Thank you. Great presentations. Uh, my name is Emil Skoden. I'm retired Foreign Service officer and formerly Ambassador Brunei. I'd just like to ask the other two panelists to answer, to the extent they, they can, uh, the questions that Chris posed. Ambassador Mirpuri, uh, in your opinion, what does China want? And uh, Ambassador Scheer, uh, in your opinion, what would America fight for? Well, unlike members of Congress, ASEAN ambassadors do not know what China wants. We, you have to ask the Chinese that. But China is a very important presence in Southeast Asia. 
They are a growing economic presence. They have become the number one trading partner, I think, for all ASEAN countries. And we value the relationship that is being built economically. Tourists, traffic, trade, investment, their proposals and ideas for how to link the region closer together, their ideas of connectivity. So from where they, they sit, as the economy grows, I think that Southeast Asia will benefit from their prosperity. And then the question that keeps coming up, obviously, is, and Chris has tied this link, can you have this economic integration when you do have ongoing security tensions? And that is something that Southeast Asia discusses extensively with the Chinese. We're talking about the code of conduct in the South China Sea, moving that forward. Because what we want to do is, again, to use the ASEAN platform to try and manage these tensions. And they are, there are, these tensions do arise. And how can then ASEAN work together as a group in the maritime security space where not all of us are claimants? How do we work together as 10 to work with China to work out a framework where there are certain rules that we all respect and move forward towards? I strongly agree with the ambassador on this. Um, uh, it's clear, it's clear that I, I think one of China's highest priorities is, is to maintain an atmosphere and um, a situation in East Asia that uh, uh, allows them to continue uh, uh, growing economically. And I think that's probably among their highest, highest uh, priorities. Um, of course, the Chinese want to um, uh, defend uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, that's always been uh, among the highest priorities of the People's Republic of China. Um, the question is, is how you do it. Um, and that takes us to the second part of your question. I think among uh, our highest, uh, highest um, priorities in the region is, is to, main, is to uh, uh, increase respect for the rule of international law. Um, and this has been an issue in the South China Sea. Um, and an issue in the East China Sea as well. And we will look to our partners and we will look to China to work with us to um, strengthen um, uh, the rule of international law in our interactions with the Chinese throughout the rest of the year and in the future. Uh, gentleman here. Thank you. I'm Xu from Taiwan, China, and I have a question for uh, Mr. Bruce. Uh, you, you, you have just made a very interesting comparison between the, 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 the situation in, in Eastern Europe and the situation in East Asia. So I'm wondering that would the U.S. Uh, to adopt a, a something like the double standard attitude to the, maybe to the risk or uh, regional emergency Happening in 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 these two eight, uh, in, in these two different regions, and uh, or or American will, will adopt the same standard when when facing the regional risk, the international tense, or the urge for American to intervene or at least to watch carefully. And if there is there a, 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 the variation indeed exists, is did is that decided by the public opinion or public concern in American society, or is by or is it decided by any other factors? Thank you. So the, the question is, is there a double standard that's being applied to U.S. policy in Eastern Europe and U.S. policy toward Asia? Um, look, I mean, from where I sit, no. I think that uh, the, the, the uh, policy that the, the U.S. is trying to follow in both places is consistent in the sense that uh, we're objecting to what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. Uh, because they're violating the sovereignty of, a, of an independent country. Um, you know, they're clearly not trying to resolve disputes peacefully. Um, and I think that in, in both parts of the world, uh, you know, the, the goal here is to uphold a rules-based international order uh, that the U.S. has played a significant role in for the past 70 years. Uh, and I think we see both as obviously very different uh, challenges, um, but in some sense uh, similar. Thank you, I'm Ching Yi Chang with Shanghai Media Group. 
I have a question to Mr. Assistant Secretary. You just mentioned President Obama will visit China, and what will be on his agenda uh, when he visits China in terms of strengthening military-to-military -military relation with China? And also, the U.S. just left the uh, long-term long-time ban on providing lethal weapons to Vietnam yesterday. So how do you think about that? And will that create uh, more stability or more instability in the region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, uh, we want to uh, create a strong, stable military-to-military uh, -military relationship between the United States and China. Uh, at the Sunnyland Summit in 2013, President Xi proposed that we uh, explore establishing a set of confidence-building measures between our two militaries. Um, and we reaffirmed our interest in doing that at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue. We're looking at two different kinds of confidence-building measures right now. One of them is a notification of major military activities effort. The other is on uh, 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 rules of the road, uh, rules of behavior for air and maritime encounters. And we're discussing uh, both of these, um, and we hope to have something positive to say in this regard uh, during President Obama's uh, stay in Beijing. On your second question, um, uh, We established a comprehensive partnership with Vietnam in 2013 uh, when President Song visited Washington. That comprehensive, we're in the process of implementing that comprehensive partnership in all areas of the relationship. And we thought it was uh, only appropriate as part of implementing the comprehensive partnership that we look at lifting the, uh, the ban on lethal weapon sales um, to Vietnam, which we think is, is um, it's about time that we did that, given the growth of our relationship with Vietnam. Uh, we believe that this will help uh, Vietnam uh, contribute to regional peace and stability. It will help Vietnam uh, 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 in it, disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, for example. Uh, and it was time. The reason we did it partially, because we want to we wanna see further progress in human rights on the Vietnamese part but we thought that the, the current progress was sufficient for us to partially lift the ban um, relating to uh, items uh, relating to maritime security. I just wanted to follow up on that and ask Chris, um, you guys worked on that, the Vietnam issue on the Hill. Was there bipartisan support for that move? Yeah, there absolutely was. I mean, this was something that uh, we had been working on previous to the decision. Uh, this was a, the lethal arms embargo is maintained under executive authority. It's not maintained in law or statute. So it didn't require an act of Congress uh, to, to ease it. But you know, the administration, I think rightly, uh, wanted there to be political support for this, you know, wanted the Congress's reaction to be favorable. Uh, and I think what we were able to do, uh, Senator McCain introduced a, le a resolution uh, back, I guess, two weeks ago. Uh, and had on it, you know, as co-sponsors, Senator Pat Leahy, uh, Ben Cardin, Senator Corker. So, you know, very key leaders of the Senate when it comes to Asian issues, uh, Asia policy issues. Uh, so yes, there was a, a very, very good degree of bipartisan support for it. Uh, it's just a question of now kind of building further upon that. Okay. Uh, the young lady here. Hi, uh, my name is Nadia Chao with the Liberty Times. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Mr. David Shear. Uh, Taiwan is asking for the U.S. to help uh, to build uh, the indigenous submarines. First of all, I would like to know, you know, uh, has any decision been made uh, from the DOD's point of view? And also, do you think this is will contribute to the stability or the security of this region? Thank you. Of course. The U.S. remains committed under the Taiwan Relations Act to providing Taiwan with the uh, uh, defense articles it needs to maintain its security. I have been strongly committed to this throughout my career, 
particularly during my stint uh, as the director, uh, as the uh, deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for Chinese affairs when I was in the State Department. I continue to be strongly committed to that. Um, uh, and the, the, the question of submarines is under discussion. No decisions have made yet, but uh, uh, as part of uh, our overall uh, uh, interactions with the region will, of course, be st staying in close touch with our counterparts from Taiwan on this and a range of defense-related issues. Yeah, thank you. I'm David Carl. I'm a business consultant. Uh, I'd like to get back to the question of what does China want. That question presumes that China is a unified actor and capable of giving uh, 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 presenting or acting in a deliberative, rational way. Another way to look at this is, is that China's foreign policy actions are actually reflective of factional struggles within the leadership, robust bureaucratic actors that are resistant to party leadership. Uh, I have a, a, a colleague in Beijing who's sent me a, a message last week that he's heard rumors of an assassination attempt against uh, President Xi. Uh, I'm wondering if, instead, instead of thinking of China as a strong state capable of these foreign policy, uh, assertive foreign policy behavior, that w what we're seeing is actually reflective of internal weaknesses. I have no doubt that domestic political considerations uh, contribute to Chinese foreign policy decision making. I have no doubt that um, strong bureaucratic interests also uh, contend for influence within the Chinese governmental firmament, um, just as they do here, just as they do everywhere. Um, uh, part of our challenge is the fact that the Chinese aren't transparent about their decision making, particularly in uh, defense relations. Uh, part of our effort at uh, engaging the Chinese in this area is to help them increase their transparency um, uh, uh, in the defense area, and that will be part of our uh, goal in, uh, in uh, pursuing these uh, confidence building measures. I'm Andre Sauvageau, and I'm the chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company. And this is a wonderful panel. But my question is this. Uh, the wonderful speaker from the president's executive office, uh, Dr. Evan uh, Medeiros, uh, he was wonderful, and he, but he sounded very strong and positive about our ability to get TPP done. I wish I felt as confident as he does. So my question is, uh, what's your prognosis? Uh, I mean, probability, 60, 70 percent, 40? You know, what's the prognosis? And what are the biggest obstacles to getting it done? Are they with protectionism in Japan or with domestic policy here in the United States? Uh, no country is more tri in the game on trade than Singapore. So, Ambassador, can I ask you to <laughs> take a swing at this one? I heard recently that the TPP will be done by November. They never specified the year. <laughs> so we just, and we've been hearing this every November, every time we come together for an APEC meeting. I, 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 it's, I wouldn't hazard a guess of when we're going to get it, how long it's going to take, but I want to give you a sense of how difficult it is to get it done. Singapore already has a bilateral free trade agreement with the US and very different type of economies, one very large, the world's largest economy, and one Singapore, a small island state. It took us a long time to get a bilateral free trade agreement just between two countries. Can you imagine the complexity of 12 countries, including the world's third largest economy, including countries like Vietnam that have to make fairly significant changes, economic changes, Canada, Mexico, 
covering 40% of the world GDP and not just trying to get an agreement among 12 of us that's called the TPP, but also bilateral agreements among each one as well. So you, you look at the complexity of that and you can understand why it's taking us some time to make sure that we get a good agreement. When you want to have a 21st century agreement as that is what the expectation is, then we may have to take time to make sure that what we get is something that is useful for everybody, that makes sense, but you need to give the negotiators a bit of room rather than putting deadline after deadline, November after November. I think they're working at their best to try and get it done. The leaders obviously have given directions of what they would like to see done. And uh, we're hopeful that you know, as soon as it's ready, I'm sure there's no reason to keep it away, but just try and understand and appreciate the complexity that goes into putting this thing together. And you know, as I look at the process, I, I'm in fact sympathetic to them that given what they're trying to achieve. Chris? Yeah, I can just say a word on the domestic politics piece. Um, you know, I think the, the part of the challenge is that it's, you know, incredibly regrettable that the uh, Senate did not give the administration trade promotion authority. Um, that ultimately came down to a decision by the Senate Majority Leader. Um, so I think an added challenge to the incredibly complex uh, negotiation that's ongoing is that if you're a trading partner of the United States, uh, are you going to put your best offer on the table if you're suspicious that you might not have to then negotiate with the Congress afterward? Um, I still think that this can get done. I think it's too big to fail. Um, when it gets done, uh, not clear. What I would simply say is I think, um, politically speaking, you know, the, the, whether this happens this year, uh, maybe not, but there is certainly a window of time to do this in the beginning of next year. Um, possibly the first six months of next year, uh, if there's the will to do it, if there's an agreement to do it. I think once you slip past that, the challenges you get into American domestic politics, where you get into the primary cycle for presidential uh, politics, um, that tends to play to the extremes. So I think the, the, what you don't want to see happen is this thing drags so far into next year that it begins to get wound up into uh, American political cycles spinning up again. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Field with NHK Japan Broadcasting, and uh, this question is for Assistant Secretary Shear. Um, um, you mentioned that you'll be going to Tokyo to, uh, and they're unveiling a set of guidelines, and I was hoping that you would share more details on that, and particularly if you could touch upon uh, collective self-defense in Japan, that'd be great. Thank you. We certainly welcomed uh, the Japanese cabinet's decision to review uh, the uh, collective self-defense issue. Um, we welcome any opportunity to uh, strengthen the alliance and for Japan to play a stronger role in the alliance. I'll be going to Tokyo with Assistant Secretary for East Asia, Danny Russell. We will there hold a, uh, uh, a session. We will chair for the U.S. side a session uh, on the, of the uh, um, the SSC as well as the SDC, um, uh, and it's our expectation that we will release the interim report on the guidelines, not the guidelines, and the revised guidelines themselves, but an interim report on the guidelines which will sort of map the way, help us map the way forward for the ultimate revision of, of the uh, 1996 guidelines. And for those that don't know those acronyms, SSC and SDC? Uh, SSC is Security Subcommittee. SDC is the Security Defense, Defense Committee. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you. I didn't mean. That's not fair. I mean, you should see the book that he got when he went to the Pentagon of, of acronyms. I think it was probably two encyclopedias. Um, the gentleman in the back here. Sorry, I didn't put you on the spot. My name is Takashi Oshima from the Asahi Shimbun. This is kind of a follow-up question, but. Uh, from your perspective, um, what is the most important aspect or issues in this defense guideline review process? And secondly, how do you think, what is the most important aspect or issue from the United States perspective in this whole defense guideline review process? And uh, secondly, how do, you, how do you think this review will contribute to the regional security? 
I'm going to answer the second part of your question first by saying um, a strong U.S.-Japan alliance is a foundation, is a keystone for uh, overall regional security and stability. That's been the case for decades. I expect it will be the case for decades in the future. And to keep that alliance strong and vibrant and uh, up to date, uh, we periodically review the guidelines, and that is our aim in doing so uh, on this round. Right. Uh, the gentleman right back here in the blue shirt. <clears throat> Uh, William Kim, VOA. Um, I have a question to um, Pentagon's architect. <laughs> um, the um, the uh, deploying a third uh, missile defense um, the uh, battery uh, into uh, into South Korea now is pretty controversial in ROK. So, um, uh, would you clarify what's um, Pentagon's uh, clear stance on this issue? And additionally, um, the, um, our uh, Asia-Pacific commander, uh, Admiral uh, Locklear, said last week that um, the North Korea's military uh, is taking steps to field a road mobile ICBM um, that could threat, uh, threat the uh, U.S. And also, Washington-based NGO 38 North um, said earlier this week that um, North Korea has completed a major upgrade of the um, its main uh, its main um, uh, rocket site. So, uh, would you uh, evaluate how uh, about this uh, issue? The uh, is this imminent threat actually? Thanks. We're always concerned about uh, developments in and the expansion of a North Korean threat to stability on the Korean Peninsula. And we are always discussing that very closely with our ROK counterparts, including their developments in the missile area. Um, uh, we've made no decision on THAAD uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and we've not discussed THAAD deployment with our ROK counterparts. But we do uh, discuss generally the issue of the missile threat to South Korea um, and we look forward to working with um, our ROK ally to uh, meet any potential missile threat to Korea at, or to the region. I, I want to inject a question. I, I was involved in a couple of the, of the meetings uh, while Prime Minister Modi was here from India. Um, and I have to say, the energy around that visit was incredible. We haven't really talked much about India. And I wondered if, if um, you know, I think a lot of us who, who work on these set of issues think the new sort of power shot is looking, you know, coming over the South Pole, over Australia and Indonesia and Southeast Asia and looking at both oceans, the Indian and the Pacific. Um, what are the prospects for India to be a, a player now under Modi uh, in this in new emerging security architecture in the, across the Indo-Pacific? Anybody care to take a swing? Well, I think Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington was very su successful. Yeah. Um, those of you who have read the joint statement have probably noticed that there was a very strong defense component um, in, that, in that joint statement. Um, uh, the two sides agreed to uh, renew the now 10-year-old uh, defense framework, and we will be uh, addressing ourselves uh, to that with a, uh, we will be addressing that issue with our Indian colleagues very, very soon um, at senior levels. Um, we uh, uh, held the first round of uh, the Defense Trade and Technology Initiative uh, uh, just before Prime Minister Modi arrived. This is an effort to increase our technology, uh, defense technology cooperation with the Indians um, under Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions and Technology uh, Frank Kendall is very interested uh, in pursuing this with the, the Indian side. I think um, uh, we, and he will be visiting India in the near term. Um, I think uh, this is a very important aspect of our relationship and I think we're ready to move forward on it. We also discussed uh, the desirability of increasing our overall military to military cooperation, including in, in exercises 
and I would look to uh, look for a stronger U.S.-India uh, Malabar exercise in the future, perhaps with uh, Japanese participation a as well. So these are all, these are all um, uh, very positive developments in U.S.-India defense relations, um, uh, and we'll be looking to, to uh, carry forward on the momentum of the very successful uh, visit here by Prime Minister Modi. And from, from ASEAN, we've tried for a long time to keep India engaged. And India is a participant in the East Asia Summit. And Prime Minister Modi will have his first outing at EAS next month in Myanmar. And India plays a very important role from the ASEAN perspective. We bring them in economically, politically, strategic discussions. Even before Prime Minister Modi took office, they have been there for some time. They're in the ARF, they're in the ADMM Plus. Each one of the structures has them as a key player. It's how I think that the general expectation is, while they will play a, a role in the region, that Prime Minister Modi will focus on domestic economic issues, as all political leaders do. So, but we, we, we encourage them to continue to play an active role throughout the region. Yeah, I'll just say very briefly, um, Senator McCain and I were in uh, New Delhi in July and had the opportunity to meet with Prime Minister Modi just after uh, he came into office. And I think we were certainly struck uh, that there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for the U.S. and India to sort of regain some altitude in a partnership that I think over the past few years has, uh, has lost quite a bit of it. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the, the meeting here, the visit here is a good first step in that regard. Um, I think our hope uh, and, and sort of a hope that's shared in the Congress is that we'll be really ambitious, uh, that we'll have the sort of genuine strategic consultation about how we view the world, what we want the world order to look like, uh, and, and really sort of uh, bring it back to those kinds of questions. Obviously, you know, the, the sort of domestic priorities that the ambassador mentioned are going to be very important for India. The U.S. can make a huge contribution on that and really be sort of a partner of choice for India. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes to the issues we're talking about here, you know, one of the things that we're also, you know, very, uh, very um, uh, pleased to see is the extent to which India is building its relationships with other countries in the region. I mean, the India-Japan relationship is obviously the one uh, that's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of focus, and we see that as hugely valuable and hoping, uh, kind of building on, frankly, what Evan had to say today, that, you know, the U.S., Japan, India, uh, can really sort of build that trilateral out, uh, really put strategic content into it and elevate it, uh, I think that would be an enormous, uh, an, an enormous positive signal. Thank you. Well, we, we started the day with, um, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the real advocates and practitioners of uh, developing uh, modern Asian architecture, uh, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. And he talked a lot about um, constructive realism and a, and a sense that, that the key for him uh, in all of this discussion of regionalism and, uh, <clears throat> and, and regional architecture is really um, the need for countries to find a common narrative uh, that focused on public goods uh, that you, you could use to build confidence. And I found throughout the day that whether we're talking about economics or energy uh, or security issues, uh, that the panelists in general agreed with Kevin that um, that's where you that's where the progress is going to be made and I think um, I hope you'll join me in thanking this panel and thanking um, and thanking everyone who put the concert or put the program together. Thank you. Thanks for doing.